but she had some demons and she falsely believed that, you know, we would be better without her. And a very pleasant good morning to you. How you doing? You know, I come to you with uh, mixed emotions and a heavy heart this morning. So I would like to dedicate today's broadcast to my Uncle Charles, Charles Larson, my Uncle Chuggy, my childhood hero. Growing up, I just loved Uncle Chuggy. He just always made me feel important, made me feel like I'm enough. And I believe that's all of our purposes, to make each other feel like we are enough, that we belong here, that we have a purpose. And so today to honor him and his memory, a giant of a man and a legacy of love, of compassion and service. Uncle Chuggy, we're going to miss you. I love you. And I'm so grateful for the life that you lived. So grateful. So grateful for my Uncle Chuggy, Charles Larson, passed this week peacefully in his home. Today's program is being brought to you by StreamYard. Put the power of live streaming to work for your business, your brand, or your cause. You could be streaming live on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, and the like, just like we are today. Go to StreamYardCause.com. That's StreamYardCause.com. And sign up for your free account as well as get a $10 credit. That's StreamYardCause.com. Put the power of live streaming to work for you and your business or your specific cause, spelled C-A-U-S-E. I am so grateful to have our guest that I have on the show today. She's a popular motivational speaker known for inspiring others with her unique honesty, authenticity, and spirit. She is dedicated to her family, faith, and inspiring others. She has experienced healing from a major chronic illness and is the mother of two miracle children. She's the author of seven books and three CDs. And her one book that really caught my attention is entitled, You Are More Than Enough. You Are Magnificent. After a heartbreaking suicide of her 40-year-old sister, she is constantly working towards prevention. And as we've talked about on the program this month, this is Worldwide Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month. She lives with an open heart and feels passionate about sharing principles that will empower others to live life with more joy. Isn't that why we're here? It's to find joy and to find happiness. She's a regular television and radio guest and hosts a popular show called Real Talk CFM and The Middle. Her talks and books have now encouraged thousands of people all over the world. And she's married to her, she says, I didn't say this. She says her cute husband, Rob, and they live together in Lehigh, Utah. Welcome to the program. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. So happy Nina to be Lynn here. Hondi. I'm so happy to be here. And I love that we're dedicating this uh show to your uncle because fun fact that we just found out right fun fact it's just amazing tell everybody how we met <laughs> well i mean i don't know how we met officially well we met like a week ago <laughs> i right? mean i think we were connected on social like in that uh, that, that, that doesn't mean we're like Right, you know. right. Like if we had run into each other at the airport, which I've had that happen where I only knew people on on social media and then I see them in real life and it's like, hey, ha, ha. and you're like, wait, I kind of know everything about you, but we've never talked. So we kind of had I've that. Seen that smile somewhere before. <laughs> <laughs> and then I and then I reached out to you because I just felt like we needed to have like a real conversation. And then we had one and it was like we had picked up a conversation that started like, I don't know, 50 years ago. I know that's the power of social media. You think, you know, people or you, 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 uh, you know, you brush against them kind of, you know, a, a cursory tour of their life. And then right. you <laughs> said you felt the nudge. And yeah. so you message messenger did me, you messaged me and we connected on stream yard like this and had a chat and it was like old home week yeah it was and then i happened to see you post about your uncle's passing and you posted on a mutual 
connection of mine. And then we just realized that I literally am pseudo related to you because your cousin's son is my brother-in-law. If everyone yeah, isn't that crazy. Yeah. As long so, as you don't have a gene pool, you're okay. If you're if somebody that you know is married to somebody that I'm yeah. related to, it's okay. It's right. if you actually come from my shallow gene pool, we would have to talk. Uh, and listen, fun fact, in addition to that, the way we're connected, Jake, it's his birthday today. So Oh my goodness. Yeah. So my brother in law, who's your I don't know what that would you. make you him, your second. Yeah, birthday. now we're now you know what? We're all confused. <laughs> Happy birthday, Jake, and and your sweet uncle. I've been in his home a number of times, and he he was everything you said he was in that intro, and and he will be missed. Yes, he was just uh, you know when you're a, when you're a kid and you're trying to figure out who you are, it usually takes a mentor that just puts their arm around you, um, you, their arm around you, and just looks you in the eye, and it can be as simple as whatever they say, but the message received is you are enough. Yeah. And, and, love, and loving you right where you're at in a way that sometimes parents can't do, right? Because we are all responsible for the homework getting done and get to the dentist and all those things. So I think those extended family relationships are huge deposits in our. And what a blessing because not all, not everybody has those. Yeah. And so. I had an experience this last week where somebody reached out and just said a member of their family was having real issues of whether life was worth living. And would I reach out to that person? And I took him to dinner last week and they weren't in a good place. And I just know that whether it's COVID or the way you were treated by your own parents or whatever issues you're going through, yeah, life's tough. But there yeah. are people here who love you, who care about you and want to listen and I, I just listened for an hour while I ate my uh, sushi nachos and it made a difference. So be there to listen. And I would just say for everybody watching and listening today, you don't need to know all the answers, but just show up. Just show up. It's true. We we want to fix. And, you know, as you shared in my bio, my, my sister Meg died by suicide um, six and a half years ago. And you know, I think one of the biggest takeaways and lessons I get a lot of messages every day is that we really do need to understand that everyone matters and that we're not going to be better without anyone. But I think what you just shared was so profound that oftentimes we want to fix. And I had to really wrestle with the fact that I couldn't save Meg, even though I had been the big sister that had helped her so many times. And I think oftentimes we shy away from sitting at a dinner like you just shared cause and, and having the conversation and, and oftentimes, you know, extended family or immediate family relationships are strained if someone's battling over a long period of time, mental health issues. And I think it's really important to know that it's okay to ask for help if you're the one trying to help. And it's okay to say, I've got a boundary and I don't know what else I can do for this loved one or this friend. I really believe that God, you know, puts help helpers in our lives and sometimes helpers need help. So if you find yourself at that place where you're like, I can't help this friend or this loved one, it's okay to redirect them to, to outside sources and professional support. So I love that you just went to dinner and, and listen, because we just all need to be seen, right? And isn't it always amazing because there are people who appear to just have life all figured out, tiger by the tail. I mean, this was a handsome man, beautiful family, and just, just needed somebody to listen. And so many people reach out to me and say, well, what do I say? What do I say? That's why I'm just going to underscore here. Be a good listener. You don't need to know all the answers. Just be sensitive to the spirit that listens and then just be there. Maybe it's a text every morning that says you're enough and there's a, a cute meme or something, but just be active in people's lives because we're all going through our stuff. If anyone out there is saying, yeah, but I'm all alone, that's not true. It's true. Everyone is going through their stuff and we yeah. can be there for each other. And you don't have to be completely healed yourself to be able to be a healer for somebody else. Well, really, I think that's where healing sometimes comes from when you turn around and offer. I often say that to those that reach out on social media and say, I don't I don't know what to do. 
you know, like I'm tired and I'm ready to give up. And I'm like, listen, we need you to stay because you're figuring things out and you're going to turn around and you're going to help other people. So please stick around because, you know, we need you. So I think that's a really good invitation that sometimes the best help to give yourself is to help somebody else. Amen. One of the most unsuspecting people yesterday said on Facebook, uh, and it blew me away because I'm like, well, maybe some of us are having influence, but it just said, if you want to be happy, make others happy first. And that's so true. If you want to find yourself, lose yourself in serving somebody else. And then you realize just how blessed you really are. Mm -hmm. Tell us Meg's story and how that changed your world. Yeah. So she, you know, I'm the big sister. And so those that understand that role of being the oldest, my parents had gone through a divorce. And so it was kind of mom and Meg and I for a while. And then my mom remarried great guy, my stepdad. And, um, but I had been there for all the ups and the downs, you know, we were 18 months apart and I had watched her battle with severe depression and anxiety and learning disabilities and some uh, of the effects, trauma effects from abuse. And, and I had watched her have really good times and then really rough times. And, and I had seen her really rally, especially the five years before she passed, she had gone back to college. She had moved out on her own. She had a great therapist, her religious leader, her Bishop, you know, met with her every week for three years. Shout out to him. He's, he's still a big, important part of our family. And, and he really um, invested in showing support to her. She had great friends and a family. But the reality of suicide is exactly what you just said, Cause, in the individual that you met with and had dinner with. I think we think we know who's struggling. And uh, Meg was a great basketball player and me not so much. <laughs> she loved to take good road trips and and she loved to sing and 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 music was a passion of hers and, and she loved me. You know, I mean, the reality is, is like you were talking about your sweet uncle who I happen to know, you know, when people love you so unconditionally, that's such a gift, but she had some demons and, and I think it's easy to sometimes think we know who's struggling. And I think those closest to her knew she had struggled. I mean, I don't think it was a secret that she struggled over, over the years, but I also think that, that, you know, we never quite know where someone's at that, that point. And, um, she falsely believed that, you know, we would be better without her. And in my faith practice, I really believe she has a perspective now that she knows that's not the, the case. You know, there's some research out there for those that have died or tried to die by suicide by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. And a very small portion of people that do that survive. But research has shown for that percentage that survived that jump. So I would highly recommend not doing that. 90% um, of them report happiness that they never thought possible right before they jumped. And so I think when we talk about suicide, especially in the month of September, it's a complex issue right? There's no one magic answer. If there was, I would be a billionaire because I, I've been spending the last six and a half years working on prevention. And I think the most important thing we can say is that it's about pain control and that people get tired and Meg got tired. I definitely feel her with me in the work that I do in the books I write and the shows that I, you know, work on and, 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 and interviews like this, that I'm kind of her voice now. And so I've spent, you know, the last six and a half years, I think I've done at the last count 1200 keynotes in I, multiple countries. And I always say, stay in your body, that we would never be better without you. And I really believe that. But I also know that this is a mental health is a complex issue. And, and like you said, in the opening, there's a lot going on in the world between race issues, pandemic, political season that is so charged. Um, you know, I, there's an intensity about our life right now. And that's a very like global experience that we're having. And I think it's really crucial to be aware that we all have permission to say, I'm not doing okay here and I need some support. And for me that, you know, has been one of the gifts of, of Meg's passing and suicide is definitely horrific. 
it's a totally different kind of grief. Um, I've lost others that I love, including another sister that died as a, as a young child. And, and suicide grief is a crazy grief because it creates this what, what if questions in the minds of those that are left behind. And so we see statistically in schools and in families an uptake when there is one suicide, it's crucial that we have a different conversation. So I'm willing to have the, I'm willing to have the conversation cause I don't, I don't have all the answers, but I'm definitely willing to have the conversation. What have you learned about suicide then that helps you in your mission about suicide prevention? I, I think what I've learned is what, what we're seeing a little play out in Robin Williams documentary is going to be released soon. And his death happened the day we placed Meg's headstone. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I feel this like in that moment when Robin Williams was found, I felt like there was this, you know, global experience where everyone understood suicide a little better because here was the happiest, most creative, I think of our generation of our time, um, actor and creator and comedian. And, and he had some underlining factors, but I think we all do. You know, I think there's not one major thing. And I think one of the things I've learned the most and I've tried to incorporate in my own life is I definitely see myself as a recovering perfectionist and <laughs> I'm, I'm always working on that because it's easy for me to slip into that, especially when vulnerability gets high. And like right now, vulnerability is high for a lot of us, right? Whether it's financially, um, the pandemic, the news cycle, whatever it is, vulnerability gets high. And for me, my drug of choice is, is often perfectionism. And wow. so I've had to really check that in me that, um, you know, celebrating that there's parts of me I just don't like. There's parts of me that I would consider broken. And so for your listeners and your viewers, I would just say, if you're in that place where you're like, Hey, my broken parts, I'm just done with them. I'm done with this addiction. I'm done with this depression, anxiety. I'm done with this eating disorder, this learning disability, whatever it is. I, I would say, you know, that that's your sacred space. And, you know, Japanese pottery are, and the broken repairing of Japanese pottery is kind of the hot thing to talk about. And I've used it in some of my speaking, but more recently I've had an awareness that, you know, that, that symbolism of the Japanese pottery being fixed with the, the gold lines, it's beautiful. But the Talk more about that for well, those who have never seen that. So, so there's, there's a Japanese word for it, but the idea is in, in, in that culture, that when pottery breaks, they don't throw it out, they fix it. And so instead of hiding the cracks or the breaks, they fill it with gold to kind of celebrate that. And I love that symbolism. It's a beautiful awareness that we all have broken parts of us. But in my house, in the basement hangs a, a somewhat famous broken rake now because I've talked about it on YouTube and on various shows a number of times. Um, the handle's still broken. And we hung, I hung it up on the wall right after Meg died as a reminder to our family that we do broken parts in this house. And it's not fixed. There's not some fancy gold leafing that's put the handle back together. It's still broken. And I, I find it interesting. It's a great conversation starter. Anyone that comes to my home that hasn't seen it asks to go to the basement to see it. And we get to have a conversation. Those that don't know about it, ask about it. Cause it's a little odd that there's a farming tool, you know, hung on my, or gardening tool hung on my wall. But for me, it's a reality that there are parts of me that may not be fixed, that may not have some shiny gold leafing put over it, um, that we just reconcile that. And I think that's the, to answer your question, the biggest lesson I've had to come to grips with that my broken parts is it is really my sacred space. It is the place where I find God. It's the place where I find grace. It's the place I write from and I speak from and I host video shows from. It's the place that I try to show up in my relationships. And when we do that, Brene Brown has, you know, really made a career on on celebrating that vulnerability. Well, it sounds great when she does a TED talk and, and she talks about vulnerability on the Today Show, then everyone's like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm so into that whole connection thing and vulnerability thing until you're the one. 
until you're the one walking around with the broken handle, so to speak, and everyone can see it. Then we're still in a culture of hiding that. And it costs us to be vulnerable. I mean, I just had a conversation yesterday. I was working on my one of my shows, Real Talk, and um, I was talking to our stylist, who I love, and she asked me how I'm doing. And I've had a shame hangover a little bit today, a vulnerability hangover about what I said to her. I shared a, a little bit more than I had planned. And I just said, hey, there's been a lot of output and the input has been a little bit of a trickle. And, and I think she thought at first that that meant that I wasn't getting all this feedback. But what I was really referencing is that God's my boss. And, and so I rely on him to do this work. And, and there's been more output than I feel I'm getting recuperated, so hmm. to speak. So I feel like my engine's a little bit running on, you know, empty or close to. And, um, and all of a sudden today I was in this vulnerability about how I had shared or did I overshare and, you know, I should have had a positive answer about how grateful I am for all these opportunities, which I am. And then I realized, wait, I, my own advice is that that was the truth. You know, this was a person that works with me and, and it was okay to say to her at some level, I, I'm kind of tired. I'm grateful, you know, but it's a busy month for me. There's a lot of output. And, and I'm kind of running on a little on the empty side. And so I think when we have conversations like that about vulnerability and connection, what does that really look like? It's having the honest conversations and saying to people that are our support, hey, I need support. I, I mean, I'm not checking out of my life, but I'm feeling like I need a little bit more support and making that like from a cultural standpoint more acceptable. And I think especially for male population, for our first responders, for our, our teachers, for our teenagers, there's certain demographics that we have to almost frame this conversation very specifically for them. Because, you know, from a societal perspective, we don't always give permission. I, I just was getting my car washed a couple of weeks ago and uh, a policeman was there. And wherever you stand on on all the on the political topics of the day, I, I've made a point when I have seen police officers out in the community to tell them thank you for their service and ask how they're doing, because statistically speaking, they're they're exposed to trauma constantly. That's their job, and the police officers that have showed up for our family on really bad days. And I'm not saying there aren't needs to change and, and create more awareness on certain topics. But I had this conversation with this police officer and I pushed him just a little bit and I gave him my card and I just said, Hey, you know, you're saying you're fine, but, but it's okay to ask for support. It's okay to not be fine. There's a lot playing out right now. So conversations like that, I think are so crucial because I feel like I talk about it 24 seven and I still got an email two days ago um, of another suicide. And I, I probably get a message every other day of someone that is connected with me, knows of me, knows of my work, and has lost someone to suicide. So we still need to keep talking. And with that, though, we need to be bold. If we have a belief or we have an understanding of something because something we've been through being vulnerable also means you're willing to tell the story. So I, I just love that you're telling the story about Meg. And, you know, it was hard for me to tell my story. So I was driving down E-470 in Denver, had just come out of my own people of Walmart experience getting groceries for the week. I was on the road working in Denver. And instead of, you know, going out every night needing triple dippers, I was, uh, you know, had my little kitchenette at my homeless Pete's and cook my own dinners. But as I got on the highway and turned on the radio, it was the top of the hour and I heard that headline that Robin Williams had taken his life. Now, Robin Williams played an important part in my early childhood as an entertainer and was a mentor of mine because of his style, his wit, uh, his courage for what he did. And and I, I had to pull over because I was bawling. I, could, I couldn't see and my hand was shaking as I turned up the radio. And I just thought, how could the man who saw more smiles and created so much laughter die alone, hopeless, 
and afraid. And I said, I've got to just help one less person be alone, hopeless, and afraid. And the way we're going to do that is being courageous and vulnerable with each other. And so I guess I'm a little more vocal when I say I believe in the cops. And when I see a, you know, I'll pull up to a red light, you know, where somebody else is probably not trying to make eye contact with the cop. I roll down the window Same. and I honk and I give him a thumbs up Same. and I say, and I just say, God bless you, officer. Same. Thank you for your service. I'll yell across the road and I might get a ticket for it one day. You, you don't, well, you won't get a ticket. Okay. 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 I'm always like, thank you. Thank you. Because yeah, I think exactly what you just said. If we're not bold about this, there's so much under the surface. We're not seeing play in each other's lives that if we go over the top in the love department, we're still absolutely gonna be, we're still going to be fighting, you know? And, and whether you want to say it's with the police and that's, an, that's yeah. a, you know, that's a very obvious one today. Right. But it, it, it's the, there's always something like that. Right. Where someone in our society is being attacked for who and what they are. And I have no problem buying cops lunch. I see the cops all the time at the gas station near my house and I buy them drinks and, you know, drinks as in like Diet Coke. I mean, come on, folks, this is a maverick and it's Utah. So it's not like, hey, you guys want a gin and tonic hey, for the road? Hey, and don't mess with our Diet Coke in Utah because it's a pretty big drug of choice here. So, you know, well, I'm glad to know your drug of choice is perfectionism. I'm like, I need a little of that because my drug of choice has way too much sugar and flour. No, in well, that's my secondary. I need a little perfectionism. That's, that's my secondary. I would numb with food first and foremost, if, if at all possible. So, well, you've been able to overcome that because, uh, no. <laughs> I got more chins than a Chinese phone book. Well, and you know what? I think I think what you say is so crucial. My friends that are in the LGBTQ community have taught me so much about like sitting in the paradoxes and and the grace that we need to offer ourselves and each other. And and re regardless of the community that you identify in, I think it's it's really helpful to surround yourself with people that are willing to have those conversations. And I say to people, you need a list of five that are your SOS faith friends. You don't need a list of 500 or 50 or even 15, but who are the five people that you know at this moment? I'm, I'm serious about this for your viewers. Who are the five people in your life that you would identify as your faith friends that you know, they've gone through some stuff. You know, maybe cause you're one of them for, for these viewers of yours and, and, and your openness about your own struggle. But who are those people that, you know, have faced some, some broken handles and, and have fallen in the pit and gotten back out. And I say five, because you'll talk yourself out of reaching out for the three, you know, you'll say so-and-so just went through a divorce. So-and-so just lost a job. So and so, I think he's he's getting over um, a breakup, and you're down to you're down to your last two, and and I would really encourage your viewers to identify those five. Say, I just watched this great interview. Share this episode with with Cause and this lady who I can't say her name because it's the the strangest looking name ever. Gainolin. So hooked on phonics. Tell everybody how to say it. Gainolin sounds like. Well, my dad used to say it sounds like Angel G in the wrong place, but you know, I no, I'm confused. Say it again. Angel. It sounds like Gainel. Sounds like Angel, but the G is in the wrong place. See if you move the G. Gainel. Right. Yeah, after the N, then Gainel. it's Angel. But but I think one of the things that's really crucial is that those are the people that you can reach out to right now. If you're not in a dark place, if you're not pulled over the side of the road, if you're not if you're not struggling in the bottom of a pit, reach out to them now, message them, text them and say, would you be one of my SOS faith friends? I heard this lady, she lost a sister to suicide. She's a speaker, she's an author. And she invited me to come up with my five faith friends, my five SOS friends, and then just make a deal, you know, offer to be that person's SOS friend as well. Because I've learned my best faith friends are the ones that need my help. You know, it's not just a one way thing. It's not like I just reach out to them when I'm struggling. They reach out to me when they're struggling. And so I would just make a deal now when you don't need the help and say, can I put you on my list? And then be serious about that. Be very intentional about reaching out 
and saying, you know, helpers need helpers. And so my friends that are therapists have therapists and, and my coaches have coaches. And I think it's crucial that we give permission for that kind of support system that needs to be built in. And, uh, I hope, I hope even if one of our viewers does that, those people, when you have that conversation before you need it, it's so much easier to reach out. And if you can't think of five, then think of two. And if you can't think of two, think of one. And then go out in the world and be that for others. Do a post, say it's Suicide Prevention Month. If you need an SOS friend, I'd love to be on the list. And like you said at the beginning of this conversation, cause it doesn't mean that you have to be the expert, that you have all the answers, that you're the fixer. In my faith, I'm a Christian. There's only one Savior, and it was the Savior, Jesus, not me. And I had to really wrestle with that. And I still do at times um, after Meg's death. So that's my preach. Well, you preach. <laughs> and I and I've talked to quite a few people recently who are struggling to find the one. I know. I know. They're really struggling to find the one and it's and it's it's kind of crazy because you can look on Facebook or Facebook and say, "Well, I have 5,000 friends." You know, you're capped on your personal account of 5,000 friends. I have 5,000 friends. And then right. you, and then, you know, you prune the tree and then you, you get all those requests and you're right back up to 5,000. Th those are not 5,000 friends. As right. we've just identified, we were connected on Facebook for a yeah. while. But we, no, no, by no means were we friends until right. now, you, you, now listen you, to, you make it an SOS message from me, cause. Yeah. And then you reached out and said, hey, uh, we should know each other. And what what. Uh, what. What has helped you shorten that time from when you get a prompting till you take action? You want the truth? I You I, can't handle the truth. <laughs> I still struggle with it. So I'm going to say to the people out there that go, I don't have one person. I'm going to say to you, they don't have to be the people that you want to go get sushi with. I'm not even into sushi, but causes. So if you're not into sushi, maybe it's not your best friend that you hang out with, that you go on a girl's trip with, that you golf with, whatever. It needs to be someone that you admire because you know they face some stuff. So start with the one, but be careful because I even have my trusted list. And what's cool is they kind of know when I start to isolate. So one of the deals I've made with myself because there's been mental health issues in my family for generations and because of the loss of Meg, I know when I'm getting close to the edge of that pit. Mm. So, one of, so one of my favorite shows is West Wing. I've been binge watching it. Well, I mean, I watched it originally back in the day when it was on TV and we had no streaming services. So like I watched it, waited every week. I think it was Thursday nights on NBC and I've continued to binge watch it on various platforms. But if anyone's familiar with the show, Leo McGarry is the chief of staff for the president, and he's a recovering addict. And at one, one part of one of the seasons, there's a shooting, and Josh Lyman, who's the deputy uh, chief of staff, is shot and goes through some PTSD. And our veterans will understand, like, He's having responses that are trauma responses. And he's he's starting to he's starting to crack and his assistant notices this. Anyways, they pull in a trauma expert, a therapist, to meet with Josh. And of course he pushes back. He's like, you know, I'm fine, I'm fine. I I accidentally broke my hand, which really he didn't. And he had been having a meltdown. And it was a trigger from the Christmas music playing it and in his mind in, in PTSD terms, it sounded like gunshots. And so PTSD is a really, and trauma recovery is a whole specific uh, conversation that, that we can have, but they get him some help. And, and afterwards he comes out and Leo's waiting for him. And this is the part that I get really emotional about. Leo tells him, um, you know, we were starting to see the signs that you were cracking and, uh, and Josh is feeling vulnerable, right? Because it's obvious that he, his faking it isn't working and they, they had to get intervention for him. 
And Leo says, hey, there was this guy. And this is the story I've repeated. There's this guy. He's rocking down the road. And, uh, and he falls in a pit. And soon, you know, I think, I think Leo says that a Catholic priest walks by and throws a scripture down. And then the doctor walks by and throws a prescription down. And then his friend walks by, sees him down in the pit, jumps down with him. And the, and the guy's like, dude, what are you doing down here? Now we're both stuck. And he turns to his friend and he said, yeah, brother, but I've been in this pit and I know the way out. And I guess that's the message I would say is look for the one that, you know, has been in the pit. They don't have to be your best friend and they can't be your therapist. But I logically know that I believe this. And yet I still find myself isolating in times. I had a friend reach out. She knew I had had a trigger about a situation a couple of days ago. And I think it's really crucial to be aware that, um, we, we tell the people that we see as our tribe what our patterns are. So my tribe knows that what sometimes will happen for me is that I get really quiet because there's so much output and I'm so public that sometimes when I need to rebalance my mental health, I get quiet. But I also know when my foot, going back to that story of the pit, starts to go in the pit. My whole body's not there, but my leg or my foot is. And that's when I know I've got to up my game and I've got to look for the support. And so I would just say our natural tendency, I think, is to retreat because we think that's safer. You know, for those out there dealing with mental health issues, I know for me, uh, anxiety tends to be a bigger uh, battle than depression for me personally. It's not that I haven't dealt with depression and it's not that I don't deal with depression because I do. But anxiety is kind of a constant chatter. And I've noticed that if I'm not careful, the story in my head is that I'm going to get it on someone else. And, and that maybe sounds crazy. But if any of your viewers deal with mental health, maybe they understand what I'm saying here, where we start to believe the, the story in our head. And what I'm saying about your SOS friends is they help check the story. You know, they help check the story. They don't have to be your best friend that you hang out with all the time but they do have to understand what it feels like to fall in the pit and get out. And I'm going to challenge our watchers, our, our viewers and our listeners today to be the one too. And you don't even need to know that person. If you feel prompted to talk to someone, to make a phone call, to ping somebody on messenger and you feel it strongly, do I'm it. challenge you to shorten the time that you get a prompting to the time you take action. I remember 11 years ago when I went through my private hell, my dark nights of the soul, and frankly, no one was there. And I think a lot of people thought, well, geez, you know, uh, causes, you know, he's got a, 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 a wide circle of friends. I'm sure he's okay. I think everyone just assumed that. Mm hmm. And it was the most unsuspecting person I would have never, ever thought in my life who literally saved my life. And it wasn't somebody that I was close with, but he's the guy who showed up. And so that's why I would say to people, just show up. People say, well, should I read a book and go through training? No, show up first and foremost and just have an open heart. Listen and you'll be guided how to help somebody get out of a pit. Yeah. For your Christian viewers that know the Bible, the story of the Good Samaritan is specifically that cause. I mean, literally that the Samaritan was not Facebook friends with who he helped. Amen. I mean, on a cultural level, they were they were warring tribes. Yes. And we need to we need to remind people of that. It wasn't right. that he was just a passerby. He yeah. was the least likely to help. The least likely and culturally shouldn't have even given him the time of day. The other part of that story that's so crucial is he did what he could do. He didn't, he didn't solve all the problems. He didn't solve the social problems. You know, after that story, it wasn't like then they all hung out together and they were bosom buddies. He took him, bound up his wounds and paid the innkeeper who then took over. So I think one of the things that we really need to take away every day is God's really, 
really willing to talk to us. I, we would not be having this conversation cause if I hadn't followed the prompting to just reach out and chat. And so I think it's really crucial when you go back to that good Samaritan story, he did what he could and then he went on his way. And I think it's important to hear that what we think the most famous, the most successful, the most whatever people, um, that we all need support, that we all need someone to show up. And it, and I love that you shared that sometimes it's not the people you think, you know, I've gone through some really hard seasons and it's interesting, the shift that happens in my social circle. Some of the people that are kind of on the fringe become closer friends. Some of those people you think are your close friends, they retreat because they're in a season where they can't be there. And that's okay. You know, that's okay. But often if you've been chronically struggling with mental health or addiction or any of those things, maybe you feel like you've burned bridges. And I love the invitation of show up and offer to somebody else today to be there. That's a really good way to start that, that feeling of connection with the universe, with society. And it's amazing that when I, when I'm feeling alone, if I offer service, then it feels like all of a sudden it shows up for me in return. It's amazing how that works. Yeah. When I traveled all those years and was on the road like 47 weeks out of the year, I, I never talked about it at the time. And I can't in retrospect because I'm not looking for accolades. But whether I found myself in Portland or Detroit or Boston or whatever, I knew I just knew people didn't know me. And I could stay in and, you know, binge on streaming services uh, or whatever you do you know, work out at a hotel. Maybe I should have worked out more at hotels. <laughs> but, but I would I would just drive around. I always had a rental car and I would just explore. And I just want people to know there are so many opportunities to serve. And you just say, well, where? I, you know, I wouldn't know. And I, I had a challenge. I challenged myself every night before I put my head on my pillow when I was on the road. You've got to do something nice today. Uh, just uh, an act of service. I didn't call them random acts of service because if they're random acts of service, they don't happen very often. <laughs> so I had to do my act of service every day. And sometimes it would be late into the night. And some would say this is crazy because you don't want to help a stranger in Chicago, but I would. I didn't care if I was in Chicago, Detroit, uh, bad neighborhoods I found myself in, Washington, D.C., whatever. But there was always somebody to help with just an ear or a smile or change a tire or g g get them back on their, their way with a gallon of gas. And you know what? I was always the beneficiary of all of that. And that was my medicine. When I was on the road, when I was going through my, I mean, it was hard for me to live on the road, but I had to do that because that was what I was doing professionally. But it, it was challenging because I'm, I'm a people person. And so when I would be done not being on the platform all day, it's easy to just crash. And yeah. I would say, I need to reach out and help somebody. And I just want all of us to remember, there are so many opportunities to serve if we just put ourselves in a position where God can whisper in our ear, help that person, go in that door. I, I didn't even know there were this many soup kitchens across the country, but uh, you know, our phones are our friends now where you're like soup kitchen or food pantry in Nashville, Tennessee. And you're like, oh my gosh, it's across the street. I had the craziest experience one night. I was in, I think I was on, I was in Fresno. Fresno! And Go Bulldogs. <laughs> and, and I was just like, I need an opportunity, opportunity to serve tonight. And so I just Googled something and it was across the street. And so it's so, e it's so easy because we do know ourselves to get into our pits. And I'm not saying this is the solution for everyone. And for some people, it might not be safe to be that vulnerable to reach out and help strangers the way I try to. Um, but find an MO that works for you. Hey. Find a process that can help change your physiology and your mind. Because I suffer from depression and anxiety as well, clinically diagnosed that. So I know what it feels like. And so it has to be a preemptive strike. It does. It's just like a logical decision that you decide not in the moment because you're not going to feel like it. 
And what you just shared was connection. Like you knew at some level, your soul needed human connection. And the quickest way to that is service. I would say to those viewers that are like, listen, I'm not into like buying gas or food. I would say, start with saying hello with the pandemic. The worst part of this virus has been masks. So no one's smiling at each other. And people are then thinking, well, I don't need to say hi. And so if you are listening to this, the next time you go out in public, whoever passes you by, just say hello. We were talking last week when we chatted. My son was in Africa and Zimbabwe for two years. And the most heartbreaking thing he shared was the minute he landed in America, he knew he was back here. Because the people in Atlanta weren't looking at each other. They weren't smiling. They weren't saying hello. That to me is such a sad commentation about our country that out, out in Africa where they have no new iPhones, generally speaking, struggling to find food, there's this kindness factor. So I would just say, even if you're not into being the bold service oriented cause green, say hi, smile, you know? Say hi to someone and and let them know that you see them in like the two seconds you pass on the street. Okay, hold that thought. Okay. I, I had to reach. <laughs> you had to reach. You you know, and I think we, we've <laughs> I love it. That's there awesome. You go. That, that's the mess you need. And this is not a paid commercial, <laughs> but Get a be happy mask. Where is that? Where be happy mask.com. Okay. I wear that and I'll, I get giggles and smiles everywhere. So even if you you have to wear a mask, you can get people smiling. I love it. And then I you can see it. it in their eyes. So what was it? Two weekends ago, I went to Bridget Cook Birch's uh, inspired writers retreat. Yeah. And I was talking to, uh, I had uh, headmaster of a Christian school yesterday, and I said the the greatest thing that made that retreat so wonderful. I know we were conscious of social distancing, but I didn't realize the reason it was so powerful for me is it was three days of hugging. Mm-hmm. I'm a hugger, and so this last six months has been difficult. Hell, hell, hell! I tell you, because I hug strangers, so now it's not even just like. I don't hug. Why are you coming in for the hug? It's I don't hug and there's a pandemic. Why are you coming in for the hug? So, you know, I I try to seek a little permission, but if it's, you know, I do too. I do too. If it's appropriate, I I, got to have my hug. Yeah. I tell people, please don't send me hate scientific information on this comment, but I say hugs kill the virus. So, you know, because really the pandemic kicked off in March. March to May is the peak season of suicides. People think the holidays, but the highest. Well, they live for the holidays. They make it through the holidays. They make it through the holidays. Exactly. So my sister died in March. March to May is when I'm here in like 10 a day. And so if you overlay the pandemic on top of that, it, it, it was a rough spring. And if you think about it, I don't want to get all scientific because I'm a pseudo scientist, right? Oh, I don't No, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm a, I just, I've just played one on TV a few oh, okay. times, so close enough. Um, but if you think about it, it's all about the immune system, right? Exactly. And so if, if you're our- not hugging and connecting yeah. pe- with people, what happens to your, your immune system? It goes down. Yeah. So we're going to find, as we look back in history, we may have done the very worst possible thing. Yeah. I really, I really was surprised to see that even those that were social distancing stopped texting, stopped messaging. Like there became this very viral. Yeah. yeah, Survival. Social, social distancing. It should have been physical distancing. Yes. If anything, we should have dialed up the social contact. Right. Because everyone went into a very fear mindset. And I'm saying everyone as in 
the Condi family. Like, I mean, we had to wrestle with the, like, do we have enough toilet paper? Do we have enough paper towels? Do we, have, what about the hand side? And if you remember those early days, the news was changing like every day. And I found myself consuming more news than I had ever consumed. And that wasn't good for my mental health. So if your listeners are here, I'm like, the first thing is maybe dial down how much news you're consuming. No, we talked about that on the show. Binge watch on, uh, you know, cause TV or read one of your books or something, but you have to turn off main street media. Yeah. Stream media. Yeah, you do you're because going on social media because I mean, clickbait. Yeah. You've got to understand what they're doing. It's ratings yeah. and clickbait, and they are not gonna tell you the truth. And people don't like me for saying that right now, but I just left a 20 year career in uh network television and you're being duped. I'm sorry yeah. you are. They're not telling you the truth because yeah. they want you to live in fear. Because it's easier to manipulate sheep if you're afraid. Yes. And if you're not careful, your social media platforms are all the people that think the way you think, believe the way you believe. Yeah, it's just an echo chamber. They're going to yeah. tell you what you want to yeah. hear anyway, right? And, 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 you know, the greatest compliment I get is people say, I follow you on, on social media because I know you're going to be authentic and uplifting. And so I'll come on and check your posts and get back off. But most of us, including me, I, I use those platforms to share messages of faith and hope and healing. But the reality is if I'm not careful, I don't get on and get off. I get on and keep consuming. Right. And yeah, that's the key that I changed my mission from I'm, I, I don't consume much. So if you think that I sit and read your post friends, I'm sorry, I don't there, you know, I may from time to time, but for the most part, I post, I'll try to leave a quote, I share light, and then I get out. And then every once in a while, if my meds haven't kicked in for the day, I may say something political based on my belief system about the clowns. Oh and that the clowns are running the circus, but, you know, take it for what it's worth. I'm about to snort laugh into the mic, and that will burst. I was, I was waiting for a good snort laugh, because <laughs> that's how we know we've hit a home run, is when we get a good <laughs> snort laugh. That's good stuff. That that is just full belly laughing when we can get a snort laugh. Well, I mean, I think that's great advice. I think serve a little, find your SOS friends, and stay off social media a little bit more. And if those three things, that's a reframe. That's a mental health uh, episode right there. Yep, your mental <laughs> diet, right? If it's mental health, then your health is based on your diet. So mental health equates to mental diet. So dial down the hooey. And if you're going to get your news, get it from one source that you know doesn't jack you up too bad, that can keep you aware of things. My friend Brian Tracy said to me in my early 20s, look, you don't need to even watch a newscast. Uh, 30 minutes of news a day, and if it's important, somebody in your world will tell you what's going on. And it's totally true. I mean, information is so prevalent that you have a pretty good feel for what's going on by just staying actively engaged in conversation with people. But just, yeah, dial it down. Hey, in the last couple of minutes that we have together, I'd like to just ask you a quick question. So how is it that you have been able to write seven books? What's been your secret? That's a really good, in all the interviews I've given, no one's asked that specific question. Um, but seven books, a lot has come through you. Yeah. How well, did you manifest that and put it on paper so well? Because your book is just awesome. In the last, that's in the last, the, the list behind me, you can see it there. Those are the books and the CDs. That's in the last um, six years. I, I would say that it's, there's another part of my soul that's um, very much about connection and messaging and, and being out there. The writing part is a more personal at home grounding experience. I, I have to say that it takes a certain kind of toll on you to write. It's a very, for me, because I'm, I'm not writing fiction and I admire fiction writers, but I don't, my brain doesn't work that way. So I can tell true stories and I can talk about true life stuff, um, in a different way, but it's cathartic in some ways. I think the, the greatest advice I give when people well, maybe it's not the greatest, but the advice I give when people ask, hey, I want to be an author, I want to publish, I say, you know, setting aside a calendar time is the way I get most things accomplished. So if you want to do it 
commit to it on your calendar and then keep the appointment to yourself. Um, some people have really benefited from having a writer's group and there's a lot of virtual ones where you have that accountability. I generally don't work that way. Um, I do have an amazing editor and I trust my editor. And so also for writers out there, I don't think it's, I have not spoke to one author and I know quite a few best-selling New York times, best-selling authors that don't feel like they have to birth it and that it's a somewhat painful experience and that editors are your friends because we, we love to think as writers that what we write is sacred. And my editor told me, I think on the editing of my very first book, she said, um, there's nothing but scripture that can't be edited. And, and it's true. So I don't know if that answers your question, but ah, that's, that's just great yeah. advice. I know yeah. we're up against a hard break at the top of the hour. So I want to say thank you very much. I love you, my dear friend. I know our friendship yeah. is relatively in its, uh, in its infancy, but I love you as a, as a brother to a sister and you're just a great soul. And thank you for sharing your time with us. Tell our listeners how to stay connected to you. Well, because I have the most unique name, Google will know exactly who you're trying to find. If you just start typing it in the search bar, Google's like, oh, it's that lady that we can't even say her name correctly. But so if you go to my website, there's links to my platforms. I have a YouTube channel and, and I'm on Instagram and I think I use Twitter um, the least. So if you are into Twitter and arguing on Twitter, I show up there and reshare there, but I don't hang out there. Um, and, and Facebook. And I really do see social media as a tool to connect. And sometimes that means I need to pull back a little bit, but I, I love to hear from people when they resonate with something that I create or write or put out there that it helps them in some way. And I show up for the one that's kind of my motto. I know who my boss is. It's God. And I'll show up for one or 1000 or 1 million. So he, he values the one. And so that's kind of my why is that if one of your viewers feels like we shared something today that creates an awareness of self-acceptance, um, because, you know, even though I wrote a book, you are more than enough. I have to choose into that every day because the voice in my head can can be pretty brutal if I'm not careful. So thank you, brother, for all you're doing, thank your you. honesty, your enthusiasm, your authenticity. We need more of it. And so I'm in your corner. You SOS me anytime. God bless you, sister. You. And for everyone watching and listening today, keep shining brightly because someone out there needs to be guided by your light. Be that light. Subscribe to Cause TV and listen to the Cause Green audio experience on iTunes and Spotify.